Sama Sambudasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Budang Damang Sanghang Nama Sami Welcome, everybody. Um, today, I uh, thought to give a talk about, about layers or even the, the practice of, of layering and what that might mean in a, a meditative life and in the practice of meditation itself, uh, the different layers of practice. So becoming a monk, uh, you've got a lot of ideas about what that's going to be like, and there are certain things that you're going to be doing for the rest of your life, and there are certain things which you think that you'll never do again. And just uh, going from the role of being um, just a, a young monk in, in the monastery, doing normal monk things, and then coming to a role now with Clear Mountain where we're doing certain things which kind of push the, uh, push the, the barriers of, of what one might think a monk should do. So in the last week or two, a, a couple of things have come up. Um, one is just uh, thumbnail, thumbnail meditation. So as a junior monk, thumbnail meditation is basically meditating on fingernails. So basically you're thinking about, it's a form of uh, body contemplation where you're uh, focusing on the reality of having a human body, hair the head, hair the body, nails, teeth, skin, and there are, uh, yeah, about 27 more of these, and you're basically just uh, seeing what having a human body looks like. So someone, a monastic or a lay person who takes this practice on might just meditate on skin or nails and just even take that as a mantra, nails, nails, nails. Uh, and you can have some surprising insights when you look deeply into these things. Um, but over the past month or so, uh, the type of thumbnail meditation that we've been doing is actually creating YouTube thumbnails, which is a little, little bit less inspiring, um, but actually somewhat engaging as well. And it's not, it's not evil. You know, the Buddha never laid a rule down about you know, the right and wrong ways to create YouTube thumbnails. Um, so it's kind of fun. We've got a We've got an application called Canva where you basically just can create different layers of an image and we create a background. And what we've been doing recently is, especially with all the visiting teachers that we've been having, is uh, we'll find an image of the teacher, like Ajahn Pasano or uh, Aya Santusika or Aya Nandabodhi, find a picture of them on the internet, bring the picture high def into this program, then erase the background. It does it almost magically. Take that as a second layer. You just get this big monk or nun face onto the thumbnail. Then get a, a picture, which is from maybe where they, where they live. So um, we have a, a monk friend named Ajahn Nando, who's coming later this month. He's from Canada. Uh, we've got the Canadian scene in the background, and then Ajahn Nando on the second level. And then on another layer, we've got Ajahn Nando. And then on another layer, we've got the clear mountain kind of icon, uh, this kind of branding that we do. And it's a bit weird, but uh, it's, it's kind of fun. And uh, it's certainly a new, a new practice. Uh, another thing which came up um, just yesterday, actually, we were visiting uh, here to St. Mark's, Ajahn Nisibo and myself and several of the clear mountaineers. We came here to discuss uh, a way to give back and create more of a relationship with St. Mark's. And we're meeting about uh, doing these uh, kind of interfaith uh, ceremonies. So in about a year's time, we're gonna have a, a big ceremony where it's up in the nave and combining Christian reflections with Buddhist reflections. And uh, I think it's gonna be quite beautiful, but we were here for that. And in the morning, uh, we had spent the, uh, the evening with, um, yeah, it was actually the, the relative of one of the monastics and she gave Ajahn Nisibo in the morning, she knew we were going to be coming here, and she gave Ajahn Nisibo uh, like two boxes, and I didn't pay much attention to what, what, what was up with that. 
Um, and then we got, when we got here, we had the meeting. It was really wonderful. Um, I think the ceremony is going to be quite beautiful. Um, but as we were leaving, Ajahn Nisbo had to go and get the chanting books. Um, and he gave me the task of uh, bringing those two boxes over to the tent city. So for people who don't know, th there's a tent city for people who are uh, yeah, currently lacking housing and uh, it's just a really amazing service that St. Mark's provides, and people can come and make donations. So Ajahn Nisibo tasked me with bringing these two boxes to um, the tent city. And when he gave me the boxes, I very quickly realized that they were two boxes of women's underwear. And that's strange, um, just for a monk. Uh, <laughs> so... I get these two boxes and we're in a bit of a rush. He's going up to Bellingham and, okay, Kovilo, bring these over to the tent city um, and bring these two boxes of women's underwear over to the city and walk in and, yeah, they're like, oh, are you, do you have business here? And uh, I say, yeah, I, I've got a donation. I say, what, what is it? Um, and, you know, there are probably four or five people sitting around and doing various things, not really paying attention to me, even though I've got this great outfit that I wear all the time. <laughs> A little bit, no one's paying attention to me at first, but then they're asked, oh, what are you donating? I, uh, I've just got, uh, just got some uh, women's underwear, just <laughs> want to donate. And it's like the whole scene in my mind just stopped and everybody just slow motion, just what? <laughs> and then, yeah, they took me, okay, uh, Andre, this, uh, this monk, he's got some women's underwear he wants to donate <laughs> and uh, bring him around the corner to take the women's underwear and it just seemed like a really roundabout way that he took me and he seemed like he had to tell a couple friends what I was doing <laughs> and it's a very strange position for a monk to be in um, but yeah mission successful we ended up <laughs> donating the uh, donating the requisites and hopefully they'll go to, to good use um, so yeah just perceptions of self levels of, of self uh, layers of, of self perception and how how can those be useful or um, unuseful for, for practice. Um, and I think it's, it's a really, especially uh, in meditation, but also especially in, in daily life. Um, I haven't heard it talked about enough. Uh, the layers or ways, ways to uh, engage the mind in meditation in a way which is um, what some people might conceive of as less than simple. Uh, there's a really great quote from Einstein, which is, everything should be made as simple as possible, but no simpler. Everything should be made as simple as possible, but no simpler. And I think this is a really important principle for all of us in our meditation. Make your meditation as simple as possible, but no simpler. And there's a discourse in the uh, middle length discourses uh, where the Buddha is talking to his son. So this is a, a seven-year-old boy and um, Rahula is his name, and he comes to the Buddha and he says, he's given advice by Sariputra, the Buddha's foremost disciple in wisdom, who gives him advice on meditation, uh, basically breath meditation. And Sariputra says, mindfulness of breathing, when developed and cultivated, leads to great fruit and great benefit. And so Rahula gets that general teaching, is meditating all afternoon, but doesn't quite get it. So goes to the Buddha in the afternoon and he says, Buddha, how is mindfulness of breathing when developed and cultivated, how does it lead to great fruit and great benefit? And the Buddha doesn't, doesn't just say, okay, Rahula, sit down at the foot of a tree or an empty hut and pay attention to the breath at the tip of the nose and just watch that for the rest of your life. Uh, he gives an extremely detailed teaching on many different aspects of practice. He starts out talking about uh, the earth element. So, uh, blessed one, how is mindfulness of breathing developed and cultivated so as to lead to great fruit and great benefit? And the Buddha's immediate answer is to say, you can pay attention to the earth element, interior to the body or exter external to the body, and look at them and examine them. This is not mine, I am not this, this is not myself. Just see the truth of that. And then he goes into the, uh, the water element and the fire element and the wind element. And he says, look at these things and s see that this is not mine, I am not this, this is not myself. Still, although uh, the breath is an aspect of internal wind element, he hasn't, the Buddha hasn't actually even mentioned the breath yet. He's giving a very 
very broad answer of what it might mean to uh, focus on the breath. Then he gives instructions on loving kindness meditation, this uh, well-wishing. The Buddha says you can cultivate Rahula, uh, loving kindness to counteract feelings of ill will, cultivate compassion to counteract feelings of cruelty, cultivate uh, a feeling of non-discontent to counteract um, or uh, yet yeah, to counteract um, feelings of discontent, cultivate uh, mudita or this well-wishing, this joy for others. And a very broad, broad answer that the Buddha is giving. And then he gives the 16 steps of, of breath meditation. So this is a very broad answer, and I think it, it's useful to be conscious of how to and the allowance for layering your practice and figuring out ways to make your practice as simple as possible but not simpler. So paying attention to the breath, that's many people's introduction to meditation. Um, but oftentimes, especially throughout the day, it's very hard to just stay with only the breath, only the in and out breath as you're going about your day, talking to the people you need to talk to, doing all the things you need to do. Uh, the mind gets very easily distracted. But if you can uh, figure out other wholesome supports for that, other layers on the practice, then that can support the breath meditation. It can certainly can support the cultivation of wholesome mind states. Um, the Buddha, as an overarching principle um, for cultivation, uh, the Buddha's word for what's often translated as meditation is bhavana, which is literally cultivation, bringing into being. Uh, so it's not just focusing on one object, but it's cultivating wholesome mental states. It's right effort bringing about those wholesome mental states that have not yet arisen and abandoning unwholesome mental states uh, that have arisen and preventing unwholesome mental states from arising that haven't yet arisen. So there is something to do, and that's a good principle, and that's what we're doing as we cultivate meditation and having different levels of our practice, different, uh, it's like um, when you're, you know, in the old days, you're making a cartoon, you've got the background, uh, but then you've got this, uh, I think it's cellophane, basically this plastic, clear plastic that you're actually drawing the frames on, and then you overlap the two. Or if you're creating uh, any kind of um, digital artwork, it's like creating these thumbnails, you've got an underlying background uh, layer, which for our Clear Mountain thumbnails, they're scenes of nature. So uh, you can see this background layer as in the meditation, having a fundamental of whatever that is for you, whether your fundamental, your background layer, the most basic, the floor, the ground of your meditation, uh, whether that's the breath, which can be beautiful, or whether it's the body, so paying attention to the postures, or whether it's loving kindness, or anything else that can firm a, a solid foundation for the practice, a real refuge. These things, when you cultivate them, you can see the breath is already here, but when you cultivate it, it can be this firm ground to a background, the scenery uh, for your whole life. And especially in meditation, taking this as your background. And like um, these digital art creation, you can foreground or background these different elements as is helpful. So taking the breath or loving kindness or the body as the background, but then, and if that's enough, if that level of simple is simple enough, you're staying alert, you're staying both upright and relaxed, then stick with that. Just stick with the background, the scenery of the forest, the background, the scenery of the breath, keeping it as simple as possible. That's fantastic. Just do that uh, as long as you can do it. But if uh, obstructive mental states, random thoughts come up, uh, knowing how to add other layers can be helpful. So in the guided meditation, we had four different layers of practice. So we started out with a kinesthetic or interoceptive awareness. So this is a uh, embodied sense. It's a location in space 
that you're bringing your attention to, the heart, the physical heart inside of the body. Uh, no kind of, you know, woo-woo, bring your mind to the heart, um, which can be great instructions, but it, the way that we're conceiving of it now is the actual physical space, which has a longitude and a latitude and an altitude in space. And really, when you practice, you can see that the mind is not located anywhere. The mind is not in the brain. Uh, it's certainly not in the brain. Uh, you can feel it anywhere in the body, but as a moment or a aspect of practice, see if you can know it from somewhere other than above the neck, because uh, that can lead to a lot of tension. Most people are rather stuck in their head. Uh, but when you can come down, come to a heart space, uh, that can be another level. So this is a tab. This is a tab uh, open in your browser. This is a, a layer in your digital art image. This is a layer of clothing, a, a fundamental. You've got your very basics. You've got your undergarments. And then the things which are right above that. And you can layer on top of that. So you've got a heart, a location, a spatial awareness. And this is great because uh, the mind <laughs> is variegated. The Buddha said that the mind is more variegated, the heart is more variegated than the whole animal kingdom. So just as there are slugs and uh, birds and there used to be dinosaurs and there are snakes and you guys know animals. So um, there are a bunch, there are a bunch of animals. Um, and similarly, there are even more mind states. And the more we practice, the simpler our lives and the simpler our meditations can be. But uh, so much of the time, certainly in daily life, it can feel, once you start coming to meditation, coming to uh, uh, a practice framework for your life, uh, you might start feeling like you're drowning most of the time. You come to an overarching framework of your life that there's a lot to be developed. There's a lot of awareness to be had in life. And I suck at it. You know, I, it, it's so hard to participate in knowing. And through daily life, this is so many people's main question, certainly at the end of a retreat, is what, what is practice in daily life? Um, so when you're drowning, <coughs> it can be helpful to have more than one uh, water wing. You have to have any multiple flotation devices. Have whatever, if you have been shipwrecked, you're drowning at sea, you will grab on to anything that you can to, to stay above water. So uh, becoming familiar with more of these flotation devices um, and then becoming skilled and allowing, as the Buddha did, allowing for bringing these but not simpler aspects of, of life, of mind, of the heart, um, bringing those into your, into your life, into your meditation, as are supportive for keeping your head above water. So we've got a spatial location in the heart. Then we've got this perception of boundless space, yeah, which is very fascinating, which can bring a serious degree of interest to meditation. So if you're drowsy, uh, if you're just bored with the kind of seesaw or the sawing motion of just in and out breath, if you can become interested, if you can bring interest to your practice, this can enliven it and keep things, keep your mind alert. And that's definitely what we're doing. The practice is one of Budo, of awakening, of staying awake. And this perception of space, like why is it? Can't This monk is saying that I can't feel a skin or I can't feel an outer layer of perception uh, or outer layer of where I stop and where the the space where the world begins. Is that true? Is he, is he insane? Is that true in my experience? And when you start playing around with that, you see this boundarylessness. Sometimes uh, you, talk ab you hear about infinite space, the perception of infinite space, uh, but how to get to that perception is just a letting down of the barriers. So um, it's as if you just pull down on a curtain and let uh, the curtain come up. There's no need to feel a hard stop to, uh, to experience. And that's a very fun perception to play with. So the spatial orientation of the heart, a boundarylessness, 
play around with that, look into that, uh, see if it helps you stay engaged. Uh, space is an object which the Buddha encouraged paying attention to. It's one of the meditation objects which he praised. So this is another layer an, of our practice, another uh, thing which we can experiment to keep our, our meditative heads above water. It's perception of space. Then heart, space, breathing. So the breath is so wonderful because we're doing it all the time. Uh, and we've all been doing it all the time since we were born. And that's great, but that doesn't, you know, everybody, it's not just by breathing that one awakens, uh, but it's participating in that and finding ways to uh, enjoy the process or at least stay engaged with it. And it's something which you can bring, easily bring the mind's attention back to because it's here. As soon as you fall off, if the meditation is one of your layers, one of your uh, objects, you can easily come back because the breath is still here. And it's so important with all of these layers, with all of these practices, to not see, to not fall for um, a condemnatory or a failing mindset. The mind just wanders off. That's what a brain does. It's, it's built to think. And uh, we are going to get distracted in meditation, but seeing every time that the mind comes off, not as a failure, but bringing it back in that act, not being a, a uh, representation of a failure, but being an act of love. So I've seen the mind come off, act of love, just come back. I've got all these supports, and these are supports not just for meditation, but for a, a meditative life. And then you've got just the well-being. So heart, space, breathing, well-being. And this is something which um, Bhante Inalio, he's not a uh, you know, kind of feel-good Buddhist, um, he's not going to kind of fudge the, the teachings just because it feels good, and he's not going to kind of give popular pop teachings on Buddhism just because, uh, you know, they're, they're fun or they're kind of pretty, but he says, and uh, you can experiment and see, look in your own experience, is this true? But anytime there's a level of mindfulness, there is also a level of well-being or even joy that you can tap into this joy of practice, this joy of mindfulness, and allowing that. This is a flavor, it's a perfume, it's, a, uh, it's an aspect of practice which you can actively tune into when you need that. So these are just some of the levels, uh, the layers of practice. And practice and see about uh, these, it's not the best name, but Dhamma combos. Yeah, so too much of our meditative life uh, when we first start off, is very um, single focused. And the Buddha did talk about a singularity of focus, bringing a unity of mind, ekagata, bringing a harmony or a wholeheartedness to practice. But that doesn't have to mean a single point as in uh, just one part of the breath at the tip of the nose right here, um, or a very narrow uh, conception of practice. Uh, it can be it can be quite broad, so uh, allowing this. So we we do this both in meditation and finding what dhamma dhamma combos work for you. So Ajahn Nisibo and the Buddha uh, talked about death reflection. So this is something which um, <laughs> isn't really talked about that much by perhaps in modern Buddhist circles, but is essential, you know, to a uh, the path of uh, the Buddha as an encouragement for for practice, recollecting death. But it's something which, in my opinion, really does need to be paired. It really does need to have a background to have that skull layer of practice, but to have a background, an underlying layer which you can bring to the fore and back of loving kindness. So pairing. Death reflection, reflections like, I am of the nature to die. I have not gone beyond dying. This reflections that death is certain, the time is uncertain. <laughs> Pairing these with a sense of well-being and a well-wishing. I'm not doing this because I'm depressed and I want to get more depressed. I'm not doing this because I'm pessimistic and I hate you and I hate everybody and I hate myself. 
Um, but the reason we're doing this, the reason all of the Buddha's teachings were out of this infinite compassion for people, if it didn't lead to well-being and happiness, the Buddha wouldn't have taught it. But we need to be smart about these things. And um, certainly death meditation on it by itself uh, is the wrong medicine for people, um, certain people much of the time. But this awareness of our mortality mixed with this well-being undergirded by this uh, general, may I, be, may I be well and may all beings be well. And really tapping into that extremely deep uh, well-wish. You know, even if one's feeling depressed um, and is, it's so easy to dip into this depressive realism, you know, thinking that uh, I'm so corrupt and I'm so artificial and whatever other things that a depressive mind tells us, really even deeper than that can be a sense of, yeah, but I actually do wish myself well. Um, and learning how to really feel that, uh, feel that, that truth. And it, it is there if you, uh, if you look at it, look for it. And so bringing that to a recollection of death um, and experimenting with these things. One, uh, <laughs> the Buddha taught so many different methods. Um, in the Visuddhimagga, this is a commentarial text that came out about, came out, um, well, the Buddha, Buddha Gosa wrote, uh, put it down maybe a thousand years after the, the Buddha was teaching in, in Sri Lanka. And he lists 40 meditation topics, but really there's even more than those, more than that, uh, when you look in the, the early texts, perceptions of impermanence, perceptions of uh, not self, perceptions of colors, certain colors, perceptions of earth, fire, wind, water, perceptions of space, perceptions of loving kindness, compassion, uh, paying attention to the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha. These are all meditation objects. These are all layers which we can combine. Some other nice Dhamma combos are, uh, <laughs> as mentioned earlier, the Buddha does talk about these body parts. So uh, something which is somewhat common in meditative circles is to meditate on bones, meditate on a skeleton and uh, Hopefully it won't be too morbid, but it's something which you can pay attention to. This skeleton, this skull, it's so close. It's just, it's closer than close. It's behind our eyes. We're looking out of this skull at all times. And you never think about that. Um, and it, there can be a lot of insights to be had from looking at the truth of, of this body in this way. And... Uh, it can be well paired with compassion. Not only do I have this skeleton, but all beings are wrapped around this, this skeleton. And uh, uh, if it's helpful for your cultivation of compassion, of, of well-wishing, you can actually, it's not too deep behind other people's faces and bodies. Just, there's a skull, which right, a little bit, a little bit in. And uh, uh, yeah, you don't have to uh, get too paranoid like, Ooh, is that monk looking at my skeleton? Um, <laughs> maybe, but uh, you know, it doesn't have to be a problem. It, you know, we, especially when you compare it, when you pair it with this well-being and this compassion and it, experiment with these things. The Buddha's teachings are, uh, if you can think of practice as one involving play and one involving creativity and interest uh, that can keep your practice alive and seeing what, what you need, keeping practice as simple as possible, but not simpler. And uh, as you go about your daily life, um, yeah, part of what, you know, when I went to the tent city and I'm, um, you know, doing this thing I don't usually do, uh, as monastics, we've, we do have this perception of ourselves as, as samanas, as, um, you know, religious seekers. We've got the we got the outfit. We got the costume. We wear this thing every day. This is uh, really a part of us. We're wearing these robes pretty much all the time, and um, it's a wholesome perception. It's it's a layer. These perceptions of ourself are layers, and the Buddha did teach not self, but having a wholesome, uh, although instrumental uh, and um, 
conception of ourself can be helpful. The perception of ourselves, yeah, I'm a, I'm a Buddhist practitioner or just I'm a practitioner of the Dhamma. Having that be a layer of practice, having the layer of the precepts, everyone chanted or whoever wanted to chanted that together. And these precepts can be a very fundamental layer. It's almost if you chant these every day, which many people do, both as monastics as in lay people, one of the first things you do in the morning, you bow to the Buddha or you chant these precepts, you recollect them, and it becomes a layer of the thumbnail, a layer of the art, a layer of your clothing that is just there. And when you, uh, it's almost, yeah, panatipata veranam asakapadam samadhyami. It's a, it's a very faint writing uh, on your whole existence. You look out in the world, and when you come up to something, an unfamiliar circumstance, you look at your rules, your precepts, and you say, okay, is this breaking one of my precepts? This is, I've got this, this writing. The writing is on the wall. I'm looking at people, but I see my precepts more. It's deeper. It's, it's a layer. And the more you pay attention to these and recollect your own integrity and your own virtues, uh, then the more it's there with you. And it's a, it's a, it's a, a layer of your clothing and it's a, a layer of your experience, which is quite protective. Um, so experiment with this and allow it and, um, yeah, be, become sensitive to when different layers are fading out. You can easily pay attention to the breath while on the cushion, but then you get up, and where'd the breath go? Where'd the breath go? Uh, it's like the big monk or nun face has just blurred out, and they're, they're gone. The breath has just disappeared from my experience. Um, and maybe I can bring it back, or maybe I have to go with a different layer, this m more fundamental layer of loving kindness just softening into my experience, this more fundamental layer of uh, trust in, in the Dhamma or in the Buddha. So um, just offer that and would love to hear about how people experiment with these things and wish everybody a wonderful Dhamma combo life. So we've got uh, opportunity for questions. Um, and yeah. My question was, oh, sure. thank you. Um, so I find in my practice that I'll find like a really awesome set of layers and then maybe I'll find like another, another set of layers that work really well and then um, it seems like the mind or Mara gets privy to it and then they just stop working and you mentioned a super mega list and the discourses of where I could, you know, maybe refer to, because um, it's hard for me to always just remember that there's other options. I see myself getting hung up like, oh no, this isn't working anymore. <laughs> yeah, um, I think if you just search for 40 meditation objects, uh, it would come up fairly quickly on, on, uh, on Google. Um, it's in the Visuddhi Magga, or the Path of Purification. Uh, there's a very large section in there which goes in depth on very particular ways to practice each of these. Um, see if I can name them briefly. There's 10 recollections, recollection of the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, recollection of one's generosity, recollection of um, one's own virtue, recollection of the devas, or the bright beings of the world, uh, recollection of death, recollection of peace, um, You've got these different casinos or visual meditation objects like the color red or yellow or white or blue. Uh, recollection on the elements, so earth, space, uh, wind, water, perhaps space. The four Brahma Viharas, so loving kindness, compassion, empathetic joy, equanimity. Um, and I wasn't able to count. What was that? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, there are a bunch of corpse. I think there's like a nine or 11 different corpse meditations where you're imagining the decomposition of a human body. And uh, yeah, you'll definitely want to match that up and do a Dhamma combo with those ones. Um, but yeah, hopefully some of those. And the more you kind of practice and experiment and allow some experimentation, the more robust you allow your practice to be. Um, 
maybe even different days of the week, um, practice. You know, these fit so well for, uh, say, a five-minute session. For the next five minutes, I'm going to practice recollection of the Buddha. And there are very clear uh, ways to do that. Or for the next 15 minutes, I'm going to recollect my own virtue or just virtue in general. I'm going to, okay, especially I've done this. Many people do this. At the end of the day, how did I spend my day? What good things did I do? And that's such a healthy habit to counteract the, the fault finding that's almost the, the norm for many of us. Um, is that helpful? I hope, yeah. Yes, thank you so much. Um, it was the path to purification. Just saying it back one more time. Okay. 40 of them. Okay, thank you. Hi, I have two questions. Um, about the perception of the different, like the heart you did in the meditation, um, I can easily feel my heart. I can easily like sense it with my, you know, kinesthetic feelings. Um, but it's hard for me to like perceive it like I'm looking like from my chest. Is that what I'm supposed to do or is it just like, just be able to perceive how you feel about just feeling the heart kind of thing? And I have another question after this. Um, well, the way that I was, you can do it both ways. I mean, heart is one of those 32 parts of the body and the Buddha doesn't give explicit advice on how to recollect the heart. And there's certainly um, visualizations that you can do. Um, uh, but what I was suggesting, and which is for me a more um, profound practice is, is to see about uh, unhooking awareness excuse me, from a, um, so just a, a quick question. Um, so do you, would you say there's a locality from where you're usually knowing from, which it's hard, you say you can't really feel from behind the, behind the chest from the heart. Um, I mean, I can, I can physically feel it, but yeah. the idea of when I close my eyes and I meditate, I, the feeling comes, I'm, I'm, I'm able, to, I'm like looking at it from, you know, like you said, from the head area, but I, I can feel everything, not a problem, kinesthetically. Yeah. Um, I'd say ex experiment, because it, it is such a profound um, shift in practice when you realize that you can do that, you can unhook. There's no reason that even just speaking biologically, anatomically, uh, physiologically, from the neuroscience of things, the brain doesn't have to know from <laughs> the brain. Um, yeah, so there's no reason you have to like, I'm thinking of my foot and I have to imagine that I'm looking down at my foot. Um, you can actually experience from different parts of your body. So ways to work down to that are actually just this idea of unhooking. Even if you don't know what that means, it is, it's a rather vague concept, but just unhook, okay? I don't even know what that means, but can I do it? Unhook and then work your way down. So can I know the jaw from inside the jaw? Yeah, can I feel the jaw from inside the jaw? And yeah, there's, there's some heat and then just working your way down. Can I know the throat from inside the throat, the upper chest from inside the upper chest, the heart from inside the heart? And I, I think that's a good training. And just to first get your mind intellectually around this, this truth that you don't have to know from the brain. Um, and then allowing this perception of unhooking to do its thing, and yeah. And then the other question I had was, um, you mentioned that the Buddha has a son, and I didn't know that he had relations with women. Is this kind of the converse of the Virgin Mary thing? <laughs> That's kind of a joke. <laughs> um, so Rahula um, means snare. That's the Buddha's son's name. That's one meaning of it. Um, and Rahula was his son, and he actually had, as the story goes, he had his son, and then this isn't, the chronology of it isn't laid out so explicitly in um, the original texts, but in later texts it says that, uh, you know, right when his son was being born, that's when he says, actually, Yashodara, that was his, his wife's, wife's name, Yashodara, um, you know, I love you, but I need to give myself to the Dhamma, and there's another phase of, uh, of practice which I feel like I can realize. He left, 
he left his wife and newborn son uh, shortly after conception. Um, so after, well, whatever, well, yeah, at some point um, very early on, uh, he left his wife and son and um, then, yeah, went and practiced uh, in the forests and sat under the Bodhi tree. And within six years, he ended up attaining enlightenment and coming back and teaching his whole family, his son, his wife, uh, his father, um, his mother had already passed away. Um, so yeah, he's meeting his son anew uh, six years after he left when his son is about seven years old and teaching him in that way. There's, I think Ajahn Jeff has a good collection of the various suttas which contain the Buddha's advice to his son. And yeah, it's, it's uh, yeah, certainly don't want to advocate people leaving their, their children, um, you know, but the Buddha was a rather exceptional case. Um, so that's the, the history of it. So there's some moments when I'm, I'm so relaxed that it's hard to get sensory input from my body and to put my mind in different body parts. So part of my question is, what do we do when that's happening, when we're so relaxed? And then the other part is sometimes it's almost like the mind is a little bit outside the body. Yeah, in terms of um, when you're that relaxed, how alert and awake are you? Um, sometimes not very alert, other times quite alert. And it's kind of a, str even, it, it feels like they're different, strange perceptual experiences, like your body's bigger than the room or s smaller than the room. And I think it's just a lack of probably n nerve impulses coming to the brain. That's mm -hmm. my own understanding of it, but. Yeah, um, it's a great question. And uh, yeah, if you're, in the fuzzy area of relaxed, then it's good to, one, just try to open your eyes. And if there's any resistance to, you know, the millimeter movements of actually opening your eyes, then you're more asleep than awake um, to some extent. Um, and you really wanna bring some of these enlivening practices. And uh, even if the body's relaxed, that's, that's not the direction we wanna go. And you're really at a, a, a crossroads in this space. If you go down one track, you're just gonna fall asleep. And that's definitely not meditation. Um, and if you go down another track, you can just stay more subtle. So, but you might, as you're beginning to explore that terrain, uh, bring in some of these other layers, uh, perhaps paying attention to the nada sound, if you're able to do that, this kind of high pitched noise, which when the mind is quiet, one can tune into. That's something which can keep you awake as you pay attention to the body or pay attention to the breath in very subtle spaces. And sometimes that'll happen. Your mind can be very quiet and you do lose sense of the body. Um, it's not necessarily a sign of success, um, but it's not necessarily a sign of uh, defeat or failure either. Um, and this is one thing which is important to mention is that in these different digital art um, practices, you can do something at some point where you merge different layers. And more and more, I mean, the more quiet the mind gets, the more you wanna incline towards that merging, see where awareness of the breath awareness of the body, awareness of light, awareness of the nada sound, awareness of the heart from the heart, where all of these things, they cease to be different layers, but are actually all supporting one, anoth one another to have this beautiful scene, which it, it is more like a uh, layers of a, a cartoon or layers of a, um, a video than they are this solid image because you're watching the breath do beautiful things. You're watching, you're listening to the sound of, of silence. Um, seeing different changes of life. Um, so yeah, maintaining attention in that way. And your second question was about? Um, Maybe it was just sometimes it's if the mind is ever outside the body. Yeah. Uh, even just a little bit outside, I don't know. Yeah, I think that's, the Buddha said in many, many times in the uh, Foundations of Mindfulness Sutta that you can pay attention to the body or to feelings or to um, the mind, or to dhammas inside, internally, or externally, or both internally and externally. And um, if you're not just fantasizing, you're actually, especially with that, what I was hoping to get people to experiment with, this, the, the feeling of internal versus external. When you, yeah, I, 
I'm really feeling my hand right now. I'm looking at it and I can feel it from the inside. There's a pulsating, um, I look at it and what I'm perceiving in my mind, the, the pressure and the temperature, the tingling is mapping onto what I'm seeing in my hand. But then I can actually feel something which seems like it's, it's like a cloud, cloud fingers kind of, you know, extending out from that. And you can play around with this and, and see what is this internal and external. And being embodied is very helpful. I, I wouldn't recommend it for everybody to go hard on the external perceptions because staying embodied is extremely grounding. It's a, it's a much more um, uh, opaque layer than is knowing the body or knowing anything external to the body. That's a very evanescent and very changing, transparent uh, perceptual layer. So trying to stay more inside the body, but then experimenting with this internal and external. Yeah. So uh, I just wanted to offer a, a quick point about, um, or, or yeah, a quick point about the Buddha and his son in that he had his son before he was the Buddha when he was a bodhisattva. Um, I, I just wanted to point that out explicitly just because I, you know, I think some people m maybe or may not have heard that as, you know, the Buddha was sleeping with women. And uh, it was when he was a bodhisattva and unawakened and still a prince uh, living in a, palace and all these things and he had a wife and uh, yeah so it was before he actually started his his spiritual journey so I, I just wanted to clarify that in case someone thought that he was sleeping with people miles thank you so much yeah the buddha was he was super celibate everybody <laughs> yeah don't mistake it got a, a few threads that uh, I don't know how successful I'll be in weaving them together, but um, th there's a, a sutta, I think it's Gavi Sutta, about the cow and how, you know, the cow is, is kind of grazing in one pasture and then sees another pasture and wants to hop over and winds up, you know, f falling. Um, and I've always taken that as kind of a caution against um, getting, like, ahead of myself in, in you know, trying kind of getting greedy about developing different kinds of meditation. Um, and, you know, part of what shapes that is there's, uh, um, if you read the suttas, my perception or m my understanding is that there's kind of a progression. So for example, that um, the, uh, the Arupa jhanas, you know, come after developing the, the form-based jhanas. Um, and, you know, for example, when you're talking about developing um, kind of a perception around expanding the, the boundaries out, um, kind of getting outside the m membrane of the body, that sounds like it's going in the direction of, of kind of a, a um, you know, a perception of infinite space. So I, I'm just wondering, you know, is, is my thinking about that too ri rigid um, or, or wh wh where's the balance there? Yeah, it's a great, great question. Um, in terms of like staying in one's own pasture, versus the grass is always greener mentality. Um, it's very important, uh, and I think that's the exact balance. You know, you said, like, getting greedy about meditation. Definitely don't want to get greedy. Keep things as simple as possible. Um, but also, to provide sustenance, you know, we don't want to get greedy about other things. But really, honestly looking at our practice, and if things are, are too dry, then meditation is not going to be sustainable. Um, interest is gonna, gonna fade if our conception of what meditation is is too limited. Um, so allowing some space, and it, it's hard, you know, in a, a short talk like this, um, kind of giving tools, uh, almost scattershot, you know, for people, but that's, when you read the suttas, you do find that, you know, it's just the Buddha gave so many different meditation objects for different people at different times, and I've found in my own practice a lot of um, gratitude for that. Like, at different, there are different things which are useful at different times. And I felt that the Buddha's advice to Rahula, kind of giving all of these things at one point, um, was is very compassionate of the Buddha because we're really complex a lot of the time. Um, but keeping things simple is definitely the principle to go for. And in terms of, yeah, this perception of space, um, I would recommend uh, Bhante Analiyo's, uh 
Compassion and Emptiness book, he really does point out there are places in the suttas which talk about these kasinayatanas, so akasa kasinayatana, which is the sphere of meditative space, which is, the Buddha said you should develop this sphere of meditative space, which is not necessarily the same as the perception of infinite space. It's a perception which any of us can practice regardless of being in jhana or not, you know, just the start of, of practice. And it's something which doesn't really get talked about a lot. And um, Rapante and Alio, both in that book and in the guided meditations based on that book, really uh, opens up the, uh, the door for that, that possibility and that experimentation. Because, um, yeah, it's very easy to feel, even just when speaking to someone else or uh, throughout the day, to feel this, the kind of boundary, the inner walls that we've created about our perception of, of self and skin and body. You can feel those kind of fading away. And you're very, very right that um, meditative meditation is a, um, a circular staircase um, going upwards or going downwards, depending on how you want to think about it. But um, things do get much more subtle. And this is where this principle of simplicity, but the right amount of engagement become essential um, because things get more still and more quiet and softer and we want to keep going with that general inclination um, in the direction of these jhanas if we can. Uh, but you can start to experience this perception of, of space way before the jhanas. Um, so yeah, check it out. I'd, I'd be curious if you do and what you would see. We might uh, have to kind of wrap things up. Um, Cheryl, if you do announcements or...